TV radio listeners. Thank you for joining us today on the Age of Fission. That is F-I-S-S-I-O-N since our lives really have been transformed. I don't know about you, but I'm not very happy about that transformation, uh, which is why I'm on the radio several times a week, because we need to speak about this. This is the crime against humanity that is not being spoken about. Today is Monday, uh, July 25th. And it's 8 a.m. in the morning, Pacific Standard Time. The show goes till 9 o'clock. On Mondays, I have been interviewing activists uh, from St. Louis. And I think a few weeks ago I said that I would be changing that up. I wasn't going to always be interviewing people. Uh, so that is what we're going to do today. I'm following that format. I want to thank you for joining me. Today's show is the last show of the last year that I have been on UCY. TV radio. I started this show a year ago on Wednesday. I'll be interviewing Patty Amino on uh, on August third. That's when the show is. But um, we're heading into the last year of this, and it is a very interesting year. My eyes have been opened. I am going to read from you uh, an article about the first secret city written by C.D. Stelzer today. I am going to stick with covering the St. Louis story on Mondays because I think it is really the pinnacle of the lies that have been perpetrated on our country. And anybody who even goes to C.D. Stelzer's Facebook page will see that the issues in St. Louis are varied. This thing about um, Oak Ridge and Hanford, the nuclear industry, it all sprang out at the same time, just as that health physicist was telling me that there is chemical waste is far is just as much a threat. And that is what John Goffman said. They are both just a threat. Uh, I had, as we've heard, that the industry of health physicists was in, created by the nuclear industry. I'm just dumbfounded, you guys. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you because i got to unload. The last few Fridays I've had guests on and we've shared ideas, but I am dumbfounded at the state of our country. We are heading into a selection, not an election. What we have been told now is that no lives matter. That's what St. Louis is telling us. Every time we look at St. Louis, every time we look at Flint, Michigan, every time we look at the coast of the Gulf, no lives matter. Ironically, the Black Lives Matter has taken all the heat for that. 
Uh, what that's exactly what they're saying. Black lives matter. Well, what we're really saying is no lives matter in America. And you know what's really sad about that? It's the negative statement. Um, so I guess Brad Yates would tell me to turn that one around. Let me get to this story by C.D. Stelzer, and let me read to you from his Facebook page. July 22nd at 2.10 p.m. The next screening of the first Secret City will be held September 14th at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, 210 Gallery at 7 p.m. The first Secret City, I'm going to open it up, is a documentary that C.D. Stelzer and I think her name is Angela Carrick uh, created, spent five or six years of their lives researching and building. So I'm opening up their uh, page that says firstsecretcity.com, and I'm going to read to you from it because we need to keep hearing this over and over again because until we demand an end to these lies, we are going to keep getting more of the same folks. Before the creation of the secret cities of Los Alamos, Oak Ridge and Hanford. The Manhattan Project hired the Mellencroft Chemical Works of St. Louis to refine the first uranium used in the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. For the next two decades, Mellencroft continued to its classified work for the Atomic Energy Commission during the Cold War. The resulting radioactive waste contaminated numerous sites in the St. Louis area, some of which have not been cleaned up 70 years after the end of World War II. Told through the eyes of an overexposed worker, the story expands through a series of interviews that careen down a toxic pathway leading to a fiery terminus at a smoldering, radioactively contaminated landfill. The First Secret City is a feature-length documentary that reveals a forgotten history and its continuing impact on the community in the 21st century, uncovering past wrongdoing and documenting the renewed struggles to confront the issue. Uh, I am going to tell you what, if anybody is near St. Louis, you must go see this, because this this tells us what has happened in America. And as I have uncovered in the last year, it is not just in St. Louis. I mean, the interesting part is most Americans know nothing about this. This is the shock. Most Americans are just, I believe that this is why we have these false flag attacks. I mean, this is why they do these preposterous so-called terrorist acts to try to make us live afraid. Because what they don't want us to look at is what's going on right in our own backyards. This is just, uh, if you ask me, it's just unconscionable how much we have got to live with here in this country. And, uh, you know, honestly... It's up to us. It is up to us. July 20th, 11-17, C.D. Stelzer's Facebook page. Here's an article he wrote. FirstSecretCity.com What did Monsanto burn at Westlake? Hmm. And what are they burning right now? I mean, Monsanto is not just creating GMOs, folks. They're creating GMO waste that goes into our landfills and goes into everything else. I mean, we are being polluted and killed. The mass animal deaths today, this is the date. Today is July. July 20th was the last posting. July 20th, 2016. 70 dead whales washed up on the beach in southern Chile. July 20th, 2016, hundreds of dead fish wash up in Mosquito Creek, Trinidad, and Tobago. July 19th, fish die en masse in fish farms in Tan Ho Province, Vietnam. 
July 18th, millions of poultry dying from avian flu across Central Africa. Wow, I'll stop here, but this is the last one on July 18th. Masses of dead fish found floating in the water of Kamensk, Russia. Look, it's not the avian flu. Yeah, they're dying of the avian flu, but this is outrageous. I'm getting back to C.D. Stelzer's story. July 20th, and this is also what the people of St. Louis are living with, with this toxic waste. Okay, here we go. This was a story written July 16, 2016. I believe it is written by C.D. Stelzer. Stella Maris Productions, that's what it says. When the Westlake landfill in Bridgeton, Missouri is mentioned nowadays, it is most often associated with radioactive waste produced by Malincrot Chemical of St. Louis and the underground fire raging nearby. But records uncovered by SDL reporter indicate another locally based chemical behemoth had, early, had earlier burning desires for the Westlake property. Bridgeton City Council minutes from May 7, 1969 state that representatives of the Monsanto Chemical Company asked the council to approve an application for a permit to run a pilot plant in the Westlake Quarry. The quarry and the landfill were then two parts of the same operation. Now this is a quote from, it looks like a, an old page. Mr. Evan Robert and Mr. Ted Bel Belsky, representing Monsanto Chemical Company, requested to be heard concerning their application for a permit to build a pilot plant on Westlake Quarry, St. Charles Rock Road. Monsanto has formed a new business enterprise as of the first of the year to set up three kinds of new business to solve water pollution, air pollution, and solid waste. They will operate in Westlake Quarry this plant. They will operate in Westlake Quarry. This plant will heat material in enclosed chambers and the residue will come out a sterile product. Wow. Mr. Charles, St. St. Louis Health County Commissioner stated they have an issue with air pollution permit for this. Monsanto said they want to get the council's agreement to set this up and at the end of the year they will pick it up and move it away. Councilman Bonecker said, will you use the waste from the sanitary landfill? The gentleman from Monsanto said, long range their hope is to present to the people who have these problems a system which will solve this. They have to try this in a field as they have already done laboratory research. The end result will be a totally sterile landfill. This pilot program will have a daily capacity of between 50 to 100 tons. However, the average capacity after the pilot stage of this type of equipment could be something like eight times that size. And then we may be under optimistic. Wow. So this is, this is, I'm going to keep going. Monsanto spokesman Evan Robert and Ted Bilski told the council that Monsanto had formed a new business enterprise earlier that, earlier that year to address an array of pollution problems. The plant would, quote, heat material in enclosed chambers and the residue would come out a sterile product, according to the council minutes. At the same time, the St. Louis Health Commissioner told council members that the county had already issued an air pollution permit for the pilot plant, which was expected to operate for the remainder of 1969. The minutes lack details of the proposed plant, but appear to, out to outline plans for Monsanto to operate an incinerator in the location. This is my aside on this story. That's why what I read sounded disjointed. Back to the story. Prior to presenting the proposal to the council, Monsanto would, excuse me, Monsanto would have almost certainly have negotiated an agreement with Westlake's owners. Westlake's operation already included a cement kiln, which could have served as a possible waste incinerator. Councilman Edward Bonker, Bonker 
B O E N K E R. The owner of an adjacent farm asked whether Monsanto intended to use the the waste from the landfill. The minutes do not indicate whether the company representatives responded to this question. But 10 months later, it's clear the incinerator was up and running at the site. A St. Louis Post-Dispatch story of March 15, 1970 includes a photograph of the incinerator and says that trash is being hauled to the landfill was being burned in the incinerator. A Monsanto subsidiary, EnviroChem, used an experimental process referred to as pyrolysis, P-Y-R-O-L-Y-S-I-S, to burn the waste and then capture and burn the resulting gases. All that is left after the burning of the trash, spokesmen for EnviroChem say, is dirt, rock, or glass that were present in the original composition. These byproducts can be used, say, for landfill, the the Post-Dispatch reported. The story said the company was considering using the gas emissions from the process to generate energy. D.L. Chapman, director of the Solid Pollution Control Department of Chem, of EnviroChem, that a decision would be made by this year, 1970, whether to try to market the company's process, the new story said. And then uh, C.D. Stelzer has given us a copy of that story, which if we have time, I'll come back and read. On to this more of this article. At the Bridgeton City Council meeting in 1969, Wow. The Monsanto representative said that the end result would be a totally sterile landfill, according to council minutes. They estimated that the pilot plant would be treated between 50 and 100 tons daily. Nothing in the document says specifically what kinds of waste would be treated, but the Monsanto representatives did describe the end product as, quote, sterile, unquote, which suggests that the untreated waste was harmful. In the late 1960s, Monsanto produced a component of Agent Orange, a defoliant used by the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. Dioxin is a toxic waste byproduct of Agent Orange. The EPA later discovered that dioxin-contaminated town of Times Beach, Missouri, and dozens of other sites in eastern Missouri, and incinerated it. The cleanup of those sites took decades to complete. Monsanto also did work for the Atomic Energy Commission during war during the Cold War at the at Clinton Laboratories in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Mountain Laboratories in Miamisburg, Ohio. Wow. Wow. That is stunning. C.D. Stelzer is probably the only one of the very few real journalists we have in this country, you guys. I hope you follow all of his work because he actually does the digging and puts it out there. And this is exactly what that health physicist was uh, pointing to. Because on C.D. Stelzer's page, there is other articles about the dioxin. So let me go back and read to you this little article. So this disjointed thing where I said it looked like an older page, that was copies from the um, uh, city council meeting, and that's why it was so disjointed in the English. So here's a copy of this article. It says, uh, let's see, this is 1970. Trash becomes gas through new process by Asa E. Bryan of the Post-Dispatch staff. A subsidiary of Monsanto Company is testing a plan to reduce trash to the harmless to a harmless odorless gas. Officials of the St. Louis County Health Department are watching its progress closely. The subsidiary, EnviroChem Systems Inc., with offices at Monsanto's headquarters here, has erected a plant near West Lake Quarry in Bridgeton. As garbage, old shoes, frozen food wrappers, and other litter is brought to the private hauling companies to the landfill operation by the quarry. EnviroChem used part of it to test its approach to burning solid waste without polluting the air. 
Solid wastes are first placed in a giant shredder. Metals are removed and the remaining composition is sent through a process called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is the burning of a substance in the absence of oxygen. Company officers liken what happened during the process to the disintegration of a piece of food when it is left in an oven too long. The final step in the, is the reduction Excuse me, the final step in the reduction is a reburning of the gases produced during pyrolysis. All that is left after the burning of the trash, spokesman for EnviroChem say, is dirt, rocks, or glass that were present in the original composition. These byproducts that can be used, they say, for landfill. Huh. EnviroChem is exploring the possibility of using the hot gases emitted as a source of power. Company officers say that, that their process is capable of handling waste materials made of plastic. Many conventional incinerators, they point out, cannot burn plastics because they generate excessive heat. D.L. Chapman, director of the solid waste of the solid pollution control department for EnviroChem, said that a decision would be made this year as to whether to try to market the company's process. We'll encourage we're encouraged by what we've seen so far, he said. The capacity of the experimental plan is five hundred to a thousand tons of refuse a day, Chapman said. However, that much larger plants could be built. H. Clifford Mitchell, Commissioner for the Environment for St. Louis County Health Department, is also pleased. It looks very good from the limited information we have at this time. Uh, limited information. St. Louis County residents approved a five million nine hundred thousand five five million nine hundred thousand bond issue in nineteen sixty five for the construction of two incinerators. Citizens citizen opposition to the site selected by the county, however, has stalled construction. Trash today is disposed of in landfills. An estimated 600,000 tons of trash is generated by households in St. Louis each, each year. If trends continue, the volume will grow. Between 1920 and 1965, the daily average of refuge generated by the average American grew from 2.75 to 4.5 pounds. The United States Public Health Service estimated that 19 by 1990, daily refuse production per person will be 6.5 pounds. Trash haulers in the St. Louis County say that with many commercial incinerators having been closed down in compliance with air con pollution control ordinances, it will be difficult to find places to dispose of trash in the future. Wow. This is what I'm talking about to all of my listeners. This is just... It's, we're dealing with not just the radioactive waste. We're talking about, like, do you get what this story is telling us that they were doing? I mean, they're not telling us what they did, if they burnt, what they attempted to do, what they burned, what kind of chemicals, what they put in the air, what this pyrolysis thing did. Wow. Wow. It, it is a stun. We, I don't know about you, but I am just stunned why our country, why our government is choosing profits over people. And that is really, that's the thing that I don't get in America. I do not get this. Uh, I'm going to go to the Westlake Landfill because there is a story on the Westlake Landfill page and I don't know if any of you I hope that people uh, at least who follow us on Mondays do if, even if you don't live in this area please do go to the Westlake Landfill page because it is about the citizens of St. Louis posting articles that they find talking about things that they that are important to them and uh, what's going on? And we cannot. These, this is one community that is getting themselves together enough so that they can take on the EPA, which, as Don Chapman said, every polluter's advocate. 
I thought that was probably the best acronym for them ever. Okay, so here has uh, anyone find a new link to the EPA archives? It may not be the EPA Gov. Okay, I'm going to read you from Donna Clock posted in the Westlake Landfill. It says, this is the one in the newsletter that government says it's no longer maintained and may not apply. So let's see if we can link it. Because what's happening, this is typical of what the government will do. They post these stories, and then you can't read them after a little while. They become archived, and you can't, you just can't get to them. So here it is. It's on the Westlake Landfill. And this is true to form, like the government. It gives us a link to it, and we can see it. But let me see if I can just download it. Here it goes. April 28, 2016, Westlake Update. EPA reaches agreement with Bridgeton Landfill for installation of components of isolation barrier system. EPA Region 7 has finalized an administrative settlement agreement and order on consent requiring Bridgeton Landfill LLC to start working on several critical components of the isolation barrier at the Westlake Landfill Superfund site. These actions will be implemented, implemented in the North Quarry portion of the Bridgeton Landfill as a time-critical removal action to prevent the subsurface reaction to the southern portion of the Bridgeton Landfill from potentially reaching Operable Unit 1. Wow. You know what that mumbo-jumbo says? <laughs> They're ordering uh, the Bridgeton Landfill LLC to, like, begin to build a wall. Ho-hum. This is so annoying. From the potentially reaching operable unit one, you know what operable unit one is? My guess would be that is the uh, nuclear waste. On December 15th, EPA announced its decision to proceed with the construction of an isolation barrier system. This sounds like the uh, frozen wall in Japan, folks. The enforcement action memorandum that accompanies the settlement outlines important decisions in the implementation of that decision. These actions include the installation of a heat extraction system, which they call HES. Hmm, from now on, they'll be referring to it as HES. Within the neck area where the north and south quarry portions of the Bridgeton landfill, use of inner gas injection, installation of an ethylene vinyl alcohol cover over the north quarry portion of the landfill. Let's read this again. God dang, man, these people, they make an attempt to make it so it's, can you understand that the first time out? These actions include the installation of a heat extraction system within the neck area of the north and south quarry portions of the Bridgeton landfill, use of inert gas injection, installation of an ethylene vinyl alcohol cover over the north quarry portion of the Bridgeton landfill, installation of additional temperature monitoring probes, and other environmental monitoring. What did they include? A heat extraction system? So what? They're, they know they can't put the fire out, so they need to put something in to just be able to capture the gas, which that makes sense. Like, that should have been done buku time ago, man. Wow. Use of inner gas injection. I wonder why they do that. Use of inner gas injection. Installation of an ethylene vinyl cover. So <laughs> they're just telling them to cover it up. They have to order these people to cover it up. Installation of additional temperature monitoring probes and other environmental monitoring. What's their other environmental monitoring? Sending guys out there and seeing if they keel over dead immediately? The EPA, I do not know how anybody who works for the EPA can go to sleep at night, honest to God. EPA is working in close coordination with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, uh, which remains the lead agency in the Bridgeton Landfill or Operable Unit 2 of the Westlake Landfill site. So, 
That is what Drew Kuhn was saying. Missouri Department of Natural Resources is really the people dragging its feet. And why are they doing that? Probably because somebody's getting paid a boatload of money from Monsanto, from what's that other, those other people, Bridgeton, from all these people. Okay, back to the EPA's website. The settlement will initiate needed actions in the North Quarry while the state continues its efforts to require Bridgeton Landfill to the to address the subsurface action in the South Quarry. <laughs> okay. Uh, the settlement will initiate needed actions in the North Quarry while the state continues its efforts to require Bridgeton Landfill to address the ongoing subsurface reactions to the South Quarry. So that is a stunning statement. We're going to take, this is, if you hear what they're saying, the state continues its efforts to require Bridgeton Landfill to address the ongoing subsurface reaction in the South Quarry. What they're saying is we're going to take these actions while the state fights it out and forces these corporations to deal with the underground fire. The cap, what do they call this thing? Why didn't they put that on? The heat extraction system. I'm thinking that that must be a cap. I mean, to me, that I've often wondered, why are they letting it escape? Can't they just, like, put something over it and then, I don't know, build a whole bunch of, like, and pour it back, drill it back into the landfill? Like, just make a pipe. I don't know. That's my simple thought, but that's what I'm hoping that this means. I'm dumbfounded, folks. I don't know about you, but reading this, this is just blah, 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 blah. But this is really what they're doing to us. This is how they're doing it to us. And people write this stuff as if it's like, oh, we're blowing our nose. Oh, we just had to brush our hair. This is like killing people. This is complicity. This is serious complicity. I am dumbfounded. I mean, like, uh, no wonder we're going to have, like, we, we're not have. I mean, Michael from uh, Primer Time, if you're out there listening, my hat's off to you. We are super screwed. I mean, we honestly, you were right. We do not have elections. They're completely worthless. If this election or selection cycle has shown us anything, it's that no lives matter in America. No lives matter in America. Look what the EPA is writing as if this is acceptable. And they're back to this uh, what's this called? This is the Westlake update. EPA reaches agreement with Bridgeton Landfill for installation of components of isolation barrier system. And I'm sorry to go off and get angry about this. Let me get back to this story because this is important. We need to read it. Inert gas injection is designed as a rapid deployment measure to isolate, contain, and inhibit and or extinguish any independent subsurface reactions that may occur in the neck area or in the north quarry. The settlement requires Bridgeton Landfill to maintain the materials necessary for inert gas injection on site so as to facilitate implementation within seven days if certain triggers are met. So what happens if they don't do that? Bridgeton Landfill will, will be required to place an EVO, which is the cover, over the North Quarry. This cover will be an extension of the existing EVO cover in the South Quarry. So right now, they only have one part of it covered, not the whole thing. This EVO cover will assist in prevention of oxygen intrusion, collection of landfill gases, reduction of odors emanating from the landfill, and prevents surface water infiltration. The settlement further requires Bridgeton Landfill to install additional North Quarry subsurface TMPs. The TMPs will monitor landfill temperatures. That could be a precursor to or indicative of a subsurface reaction in the North Quarry. Measurement of landfill temperatures and gas and landfill gas composition will be used to assess the performance of the HES. Oh, HES. Here they go again. Heat extraction system. Okay. 
The settlement also requires the installation of two sulfur dioxide air monitors for a period of one year. These monitors will be operational within 30 days of EPA's approval of the work plan. The location and type of the monitor will be determined after consultation with an approval by EPA and MDNR. Work plans for HES, inert gas injection, and environmental monitoring will be submitted within 30 days of the settlement. Work uh, for the EVO cover will be submitted within 60 days. The settlement will further require completion of the HES within four months of the construction start date. But when is that? The e I mean, when do they compel the start date of that? within 30 days. The plans will be submitted, but they don't tell us when they're demanding them to start. The protection of human health and the environment remains... What? How can this person write this? Okay, I'm sorry. The protection of human health and the environment remains EPA's top priority at the Westlake Landfill Superfund site. And this settlement demonstrates EPA's commitment to protecting the community and on-site workers. I mean, how do these people sleep at night and buy this? I mean, they have to believe this. EPA continues to work on the technical and legal details of the remaining portions of the isolation barrier and will provide these details to the public when they are available. The Settlement and Enforcement Action Memorandum are available on EPA's Westlake Landfill site, uh, www.3.epa.gov forward, forward slash region 07 forward slash clean up forward slash west underscore lake underscore landfill. Wow. <laughs> I, I have to say, folks, I was shocked that like they really care about people. I do not know how they can live with themselves. Honestly, this I'm, I happen to be on the EPA's West Lake Landfill page. It, that link that Donna Clock uh, provided for us on the Westlake Landfill page was that link. So thank you. Donna Clock has just been uh, a champion for her city. And I don't know her personally. I think she has called in once on the show. She wanted to set the record straight about something and did actually do a great job of it. Uh, and she just is a busy woman. And, you know, uh, I don't think she has time, and I don't think she feels like it's, uh, she's, for my take of what I see of her postings, she wants to get things done. And uh, I think that th this is why I've taken to reading these newspaper articles, because, you know, people in St. Louis, I get it, they're living with a, a catastrophic event that is being ignored. And... While we may be jumping up and down, they're living with it. And we really, as much as we get it out on the air and talk about it, Don Chapman's gone to D.C. She's met with President Obama. Actually, President Obama even referred to, oh, yeah, she's working with the St. Louis folks. The folks in St. Louis, right, felt like the ones who die of cancer, President Obama, because the EPA is ignoring this and demanding what nothing, Region 7, what they tell us. And, you know, they're, now they're asking him to put a cap on things and start doing things right. And as Donna Clock posted a picture, if you go to this EPA archives on the Westlake Landfill, there's a picture of them building an installation. Contractors under EPA begin installation of heat extraction system in the neck of the Westlake Landfill. And it's really ironic because there's a guy standing there on a construction site with a face mask on, gloves on, but I mean, hat on, but no gloves. And as Donna said, could this just be a photo op? Because the guy's on a he's on a construction site with no gloves on. <laughs> he's standing there holding a big piece of equipment like they're doing something with no gloves on. You're telling me he's working out there with no 
gloves on. This is how dumb these people are. They think nobody notices. And guess what? It's not that they're dumb. They know we can't do jack about it. <laughs> That's really what it is. It's like Hillary Clinton. She's like, yeah, who cares? We killed that kid, Seth Rich. He, he was going to give out the election fraud stuff two weeks before the convention. Like, that couldn't happen. So we had to have somebody fix the problem. He had all the information in his head. That's why they had to kill him. I mean, it is outrageous. The Democratic Party is asking us to elect a person who has stolen the nomination. Literally, it has come out. And the Republican Party is asking us to elect a person who is going to let the vice president run the president's office. It is becoming well known that Mike Pence will set the agenda. We're going to have a Bush-Cheney kind of a deal where Mike Pence will be... Anybody knows Mike Pence? I'll be honest, he freaking scares me. I mean, I, Mike Pence is the man who actually, his office lied. We are going to get more of the same folks with those kinds of people. You, th you think we're going to have less fascism with Trump? We are going to have more fat. Frankly, it's not more or less. Clinton and Trump, they're identical. They are completely identical. And our, our, our votes don't matter. As we're seeing in St. Louis, our people don't matter. In Flint, our people don't matter. On the coast, our people don't matter. You know, when the Navy won't take back the land from San Onofre, which is sitting right on the coast of California in a beautiful area, very affluent, extremely populated, they're letting kids surf in those waters. And the land is too contaminated for the Navy to take back. And our government says nothing. Our government says nothing. Right now, we have people dying in St. Louis, and our government is doing nothing. People at the Westlake landfill, you know what they have to do? Uh, there is a uh, protest, in protest in Philadelphia. These people brought themselves to Philadelphia. Don Chapman posted this. It is a protest. It's a video of people with signs. They're doing a die-in in Philadelphia. Protests in Philadelphia urging the passage of H.R. 4100 and cleanup of Westlake Landfill. They staged a die-in with, in, with, they staged, I'm going to read this again. They staged a die-in with one minute for every year the fire has been burning. Oh my gosh. Wow. One minute for every year the fire has been burning. And they have protest signs. They have children that made it out there. It says, signs say, we are sick. St. Louis, Republic Service is toxic for our community. Representative Frank Pallone. Frank Pallone and, uh, let me see, I'm going to read more of this. Direct action alert. DNC. Join us at 6 p.m. for the rally for a direct action of Westlake Landfill, demanding that Congressman Frank Pallone and Congressman John Shimkus let Congress vote on H.R. 41. These are two congressmen holding up H.R. 41 in the House because why? I think it's because they want money for their own districts. Asking citizens to call their reps and ask them to advocate for H.R. 41 and vote yes on it. I already have. H.R. 41 will require the Secretary of the Army, acting through the Chiefs of Engineers, to undertake remediation oversight of the Westlake Landfill located in Bridgeton, Missouri. That's all it does. It allows the Chief of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers, to take over the remediation of the Westlake Landfill. And it is being blocked by Congressman Frank Pallone and Congressman John Shimkus. For reasons unknown to us, what is it going to take in our country for people to really care? I mean, we're, we're, we have these protests going on, uh, major protests in our country, but because we have such deep fascism, people don't hear it. It's like this radio station, <laughs> ironically. People don't even know how to get to the radio station if they can't turn on the television or can't turn on the radio. So they do find us, and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people hear our voice. But do we hear it on mainstream media? Do we hear any of this information so that when we talk to someone and I say, wow, do you know what's going on in St. Louis? They're like, no, what? That's exactly what they want. 
Or when I say, did you know that the the guy from the DNC who was investigating election fraud was murdered in his apartment at 4 o'clock in the morning while he was on the phone with his girlfriend. She heard him struggle. He, the guy was shot in the back four times. The assailant overcame him and shot him in the back four times and left his apartment without taking a thing. And two days later, Bernie Sanders endorsed Clinton. No. Huh. Those are serious implications that I'm saying, and I believe them to be true. And I have said that to Congress. I think that Clinton murdered that kid. And then we have Trump asking us to have Pence behind him, who is believes in reinstatement camps for gay people, thinks that women that have had abortions ought to go to jail. The guy is a serious fascist. He has no problem throwing people in jail. Make America great to him means bloody up America with the blood of those dissidents who aren't going to click their heels and say, uh, Sig Heil. You know, Nazism, the Nazis were a religious fanatic group. They thought they were cleansing Germany for God. That's how they could just disregard the lives of the Jews and the gypsies and the gay people. I... I my body is chilled these days at the way that our country is ignoring the crime in St. Louis. It is massive. You talk about a massive cover-up. It starts there, at least in Hanford. We provide those workers with some semblance of regard. I mean, people cannot live right next door to Hanford or the Columbia Generating Station. It's 15 miles away. It's far away. They make people live away from there. In St. Louis, we have not only lied, but these people have been active for years. Stories have been leaking out. I just read you a story from the 70s. <sighs> it's such an outrage. It is such an outrage that our country is willing to just ignore it all. I, I do not know how we can live with ourselves if this country allows this to happen to ourselves. I mean, really. I hope people have watched that movie, V for Vendetta, because honestly, that was, that was a, a, kind of a scary movie now that I look back on it. But you know what? It does give you hope. But I mean, at the end... It, it's kind of frightening. It's kind of like what Richie Allen says. People don't stand up because they know the day after they make that decision to stand up, their lives change. Like my life changed when I started to stand up. Here I am three years later on the radio. I've been on the radio now for one full year. You know, it's kind of a shock. On Wednesday, we're going to be interviewing Mimi German from No Manukes Northwest. She's going to be updating us on the uh, closure of the Columbia Generating Station, which we must demand before we have a catastrophic event. Everybody ought to be calling up the City Council of St. Louis and saying, hey, you know what, we really need you to start getting behind closing the Columbia Generating Station because if anything happened to that, it would affect us here in Michigan and in, in St. Louis. It would affect us everywhere, the entire country. If we had an earthquake there, folks, it is bye-bye North America because Hanford is less than 15 miles. We think St. Louis is bad. Saint, thank God St. Louis is not on an earthquake zone, which no doubt with the fracking, it probably is sometime soon. I'm going to get back to the Westlake Landfill page because we have 10 minutes left and these people really deserve all of us to start caring. Okay, I'm going to read this story. It's called, it was posted, Scott's Contracting. We know Scott. Scott is the man who is doing the phytoremediation. He'll be on with us again shortly. He's, he wants to come to us with new information, not just discuss the same old stuff but he will be speaking with us. He shared Jane, uh, someone else's post, and uh, that comment by that person, it was posted July 23rd, said, St. Louis, Westlake Landfill, runaway ticking nuclear time bomb that has residents terrified. I'm going to open this in a new link. What can we do? That's the question. I mean, when we have... Uh, we have our elected officials, Frank Pallone, Shimkus, refusing 
to just allow the transfer of the remediation of the known contaminants to an organization that can manage it. The EPA has never, ever handled nuclear waste. It's not in their venue. So why are they stopping it? It, it is a heartbreak. Okay, this story is from truthout.org. That's truth-out.org. This is a great this this page is people that write truth out really uh, are, know how to write and you know good lefties I guess as we call them <laughs> they actually are uh, open minded that's what I consider to be left to be honest is the left brain the left brain the one where you're open you you know you're thinking and you allow other thoughts to come in. So this is an excerpt from a public meeting on the Westlake Landfill, transcript pr written in the truthout.org. It's 850. We have about eight minutes left. I'm going to see if I can get through this. Don Chapman, the federal government is a responsible party on paper for what happens on Westlake. Crowd member and Exelon. And I'm not going to say who's talking because really it gets kind of confusing since this is a transcript. Ex and Exelon will write the check for inaudible, is our understanding. What about Mellencrot? Mellencrot, when they entered into a contract with the DOE, the DOE, DOE took it all away. Mellencrot signed away their ability to be charged in just about anything. They have complete immunity. Thank you for tuning in to the Enviro News News Desk. Da, da, da. This is too... This is too complicated for me to read to you folks in 10 minutes. If I had a long time, I would. But I will encourage you to go to the Westlake Landfill page and read this because it does. It's basically Arnie Gunderson. It's an interview with Arnie Gunderson talking about nuclear power in our world today. And it's the little excerpt of that with Arnie talking about this really is a ticking time bomb. And it is a ticking time bomb. It's it's not anything that we can just decide to ignore. Uh, okay, here's one from July 15th, posted from the Just Moms STL, Editorial Regulatory Agencies Treating Westlake Landfill Like a Hot Potato. Yeah, but that's kind of standard operations, isn't it, folks? I mean, isn't that what they do? Anything that's important, they just kick it down the road. So we've got chemical pollution. We have Monsanto from way back digging their heels into this uh, into this thing. And God knows what they burned. This is the problem. We have no idea what they're doing. This is what I have discovered in the last year. When I started this radio show, frankly, it was really to promote Kevin Blanche's Post Ignorance Project. And that didn't transpire and I decided, you know what, I'm going to start looking into other ideas. Like, what is it? Who's doing what? And what communities are being affected? And I stumbled into this. This is the biggest unknown story in our country. And I'm just dumbfounded that Americans shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, it's, it's really bad. It's worse than really bad. I mean, it's like the election fraud. The kid who was investigating the election fraud was murdered two days before Bernie Sanders, quote, endorsed Clinton, was bullied, was forced by the mafia DNC to do so. I mean, and people are ignoring the fact of the cold-hearted, look at what Mike Pence has done to his state. People are suffering in this country at the hands of the Republican agenda. So I, I, I do not know. You know, and then we have the Democrats. Like, it's two Democrats holding up the EPA, holding up the transfer of the EPA. And why? Probably because they want to cut of the pie for their own districts. That's why. Because they know that if anybody looks at this, once this thing gets passed, everyone's going to go, yeah, let's give them most of the money. So, you know, that's what I think it's about. It's about money. The only thing that matters in this country, money matters. No lives matter. That's what this election has shown us. No lives matter. So our directive is how do we turn that around? 
How do we make this? How do we turn this into something where our lives matter? Our children matter. Our planet matters. Our We have fish, the, the mass animal deaths. Just this month alone, I read three, one, two, three days. Millions of poultry, massive dead fish. If you think the fish are dying, folks, wait till you see us. I mean, they're going first. It's un when, at what point do people care about their children more than they care about their jobs? We need conscientious objectors. We need people to say, wait a minute, I can't do this anymore. You know, we need to do something completely different. Massive die off of fish along 15 kilometers of coast in Tobasco, Mexico. That is outrageous. 90 tons of fish die. West Java, Indonesia. At what point are we going to start saying we cannot just be clicking in on the information and saying oh my god this is just so horrible I mean the people in St. Louis my hat is off to them they're doing everything they possibly can think of they're doing protests these people brought themselves to the Democrats I you know they're doing what they can to do they do sit-ins they they hold town meetings people are actively engaged and yet, crickets from our government. Crickets. Why? Because corporations own our country. No lives matter to them. We are assets on a balance sheet, and that is the truth. And until we decide we're not going to do that anymore, they're going to continue to do it to us. And what is it? Do you know that the Homegrown Terrorist Act, do you know that if I was to call, say, for a, a No Work Monday, and I got like two million people across the country to just stay home on Monday like they did in South Africa, nobody went to work once a week. That's how they broke apartheid. Nobody went to work once a week. No Work Monday. They stopped Mondays in South Africa. And it hurt the economy so bad they had to start. It wasn't the protests. It wasn't them, the black people working and doing what they could legally. It only had to do with the fact that they did the No Work Monday. So who wrote the No, the Homegrown Terrorist Act? Miss Jane Harmon, one of the two women who saw the uh, torture tapes. So instead of revealing the torture tapes, she writes uh, the Homegrown Terrorist Act, which says that if you and I start a, a, a protest, a No Work Monday protest, you and I go to jail. They can convict us as economic terrorists because we're hurting the economic stability of this country. That's right, folks. The economic stability is equivalent to our uh, security. That's really essentially what they're saying. As if we could not live without Monsanto. As if we could not live without Bechtel. It is an outrage. It is an outrage. The underlying legislation. Hitler got in because it had a full parliament. The Nazis were a movement to make Germany great again. It is the same thing on both sides of the aisle, folks. I do not know what it's going to take, but we have got to put our courage feet on. And you have got to pay attention. Look for alternative sources. Don't just listen to mainstream media, for goodness sakes. Thank you for listening to our radio show. God bless the people of St. Louis. And thank you for all your activism and showing us how to put our courage feet on. Because you guys definitely have. And I will keep on this story. And I'm going to look for someone to interview next week. And we'll talk to you Wednesday with Mimi German. Put your courage feet on.